people are speaking with me in between they keep anticipating stuff that's coming up so you know that's that's great so again this presentation has some um, repetitive stuff that I'll just click through and get to the uh, to the important parts um, <clears throat> So here's my joke. I don't know how many, well, I did hear somebody say, we have all the algae we need. Yeah, I mean, that's an assumption, but if you don't, you know, um, well, at least you're rich. Um, or, um, so, you know, most people are more in this mode. Um, yeah, you know, it's like feeding on cultured algae tends to be expensive and, and, and um, time consuming. So <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through the entire rant of this, but I wanted to get to this. This is a version of this is in your handouts. And I've showed you a bunch of experimental results where we you know, <clears throat> showed that performance of oysters at least and scallops. <clears throat> and to some degree and how exactly we don't know, clams is responsive to the biochemical uh, composition of the algal food. So what I've got here for you is a semi-quantitative um, profile for each of, uh, how many? I, don't, I didn't even count. There's probably uh, 18 or something strains of algae that, that people have used in, <clears throat> in, uh, for feeding shellfish. And they're kind of divided up into, um, in, into um, you know, what class they're in. So we have, uh, Prognisiophytes, diatoms, presenophytes, and um, I guess we did have some some roto stuff. <clears throat> and what I've done is, you know, to just um, give, give a you know a, plus, a zero, a plus, or a double plus for each of the important um, lipid components: starch as a source of energy, uh, and you know, cholesterol itself, or twenty-four methylated sterols <clears throat> and you know a plus means there's some there plus plus means it's it's a it's good supplement a zero means you don't depend on that alga for that component of the diet and then the second sheet is um how well these different kinds of these different strains um, grow under different cultivation systems and this is a consensus of nearly 20 years of algal culture workshops in in my lab and our own experience so you know again it's, they either you know they grow poorly it's a minus if they grow okay it's a plus if they grow if it's a double plus they grow the best in in carboy uh, a tube which cow wall that would include um oops the the standing up bags uh, sorry. Uh, you know, and then a tank is more the open tank kind of thing that that I uh, that I showed you pictures of before. So, <clears throat> and then the culture management options we already talked about: um, batch, continuous, or semi-continuous. And again, I <clears throat> have a um, a consensus of People who have come to my workshops and I've asked them the question, you know, kind of polled people um, through email and, and phone conversations. And, and, you know, I've got this general um, consensus of what kinds of culture work best for different, different strains in a practical hatchery environment. This isn't a, in a lab or university setting. This is in a, in a hatchery setting. <clears throat> so I've tried to like compile this knowledge and, and put it into a framework that you can use it and here's uh, an example one I'm going to get, show you two quick examples one is is um, oyster broodstock feeding and as I said it was um, had a Fulbright scholar um, Ghazala Siddiqui from Pakistan who you know worked with me hard on a lot of this for a year and a half um, and you know <clears throat> besides the summary finding that feeding them in the in the fall was the best approach there's like a lot of we worked through strategizing broodstock feeding, assuming that we would want to do that in the spring. Uh, so, but it's a good, again, a really good example. So first thing, what do we need for, you know, good egg quality? Well, we know we need um, 
some DHA. We know we need um, a lot of energy, so we get that in lip, total lipid or starch. We know we need you know, some cholesterol or 24 methylene cholesterol. So these dots have helped us identify the double pluses for the components we know are important. So if we want to formulate, that's going right, you know, how do you formulate, formulate a mixed diet? If we want to formulate a good diet for conditioning brood stock oysters, these are our choices for the different components to get, you know, exceptionally high amounts for, <clears throat> we can choose, uh, what are these? Pavlovas for, for these components, or we can choose some diatoms, or we can choose some uh, promnesiophytes. Um, you know, and uh, if we look at it in the other direction, the uh, presenophytes have almost everything we need except DHA. Okay, so this is how we would, we would look at this and just to determine, well, okay, biochemically what, what's important and which kinds of algae have those things. So there's no one kind of algae that has everything we need. So the first thing we decide from this is, we're going to need to make a mixed diet to, to have a nutritionally complete uh, diet to, to feed. So, you know, next thing we're going to do is, is figure out, well, what kind of culture do we do in our hatchery? Do we, do we only grow algae and carboys? If so, um, you know, these pavlovas are good, good choices. But if we're growing in cow wall bags or, or tanks, you know, it looks like um, we... <clears throat> We maybe want to be thinking about diatoms or um, presentophytes. And then, you know, how, how best do these grow? Well, you know, again, I'm a proponent, but, you know, all of these, um, these, these two, the diatoms that we determine if we, you know, diatoms provide us everything that tetracelmus doesn't, um, all grow very well in a semi-continuous management uh, strategy. So this is how we're, how we're gonna grow the algae. So now the how much part, which is, um, it's like, I'm just gonna run you through arithmetic. If it makes sense to you, great. You know, if it doesn't, we'll, we'll kind of go, go back through. But, you know, again, this is based on things I've, I've, I've talked to you about already. Um, we want 2% of the dry weight um, of oyster soft tissue in dry weight. This is from a, an older publication from Sue Uting in the UK. So we first had to figure out how much dry tissue weight, um, soft you know, tissue weight there is in a broodstock size oyster. So we went to the literature and we found enough numbers that we could calculate um, that we need about 600 mil of algal culture for each kilogram of broodstock oysters with some um, assumptions about what density our algal cultures were. So, um, you know, F in F medium, which we use in our big cultures, instead of F over two, we use F medium. Um, we get about 200 milligrams per liter of, of most algae. So, you know, this, this gives us an idea of, for every kilogram of broodstock oysters, we need about 600 mil of, of algae per day. Uh, and then is the, the other thing, that a conversation during the break. You know, how much water do you need to put a kilogram of broodstock oysters in for this to work. And what we want to be careful of is we don't want to put um, <clears throat> more than 10 milligrams of dry weight of algae per liter in the water, or the oysters are going to produce pseudofeces because they're trying to breathe and there's so much algae in their gills that they can't breathe effectively, so they reject the algae. And this is again, it's a literature value. Um, so for a kilogram of oysters, we need uh, about 12 liters of water, so that uh, if we feed once a day, uh, we, we would need 12 liters of water to put that 600 mil of algae containing, uh, you know, the nutrition that, that we, we think the broodstock oysters need, according to Sue Uting's publication. <clears throat> so, you know, the volume of water is variable. If you feed only once a day, if you're lazy, then you need a larger volume. But if you do um, several feedings per day, you can put that kilogram of oysters in progressively smaller amounts of water, you know, to some limit, um, and assuming the oysters are clearing the algae. <clears throat> so 
So um, it turns out that um, about three to four really big broodstock oysters uh, weigh a kilogram. And so, you know, to follow Sue Ooting's uh, data and a bunch of numbers from, you know, good reliable literature sources, we need about two liters um, a day per, per oyster. And um, if you're paying to heat the water, that's, um, you, you want to do a bunch of small feedings because you don't want to pay to heat. You guys don't have water heating problems. I guess I shouldn't be saying that here. But, you know, we're, we're conditioning in the Northeast. The water is minus one Celsius. So, you know, to get that to 25 is, is really expensive. But maybe you don't have that problem here. Um, so here's how we, we walk through the, the arithmetic on this. We've decided based on um, what we know from the literature and those three pages that to be nutritionally com complete, we need a mix of a diatome and tetracelmus. Um, we're going to grow diatomes in cow walls or tube cultures because they do okay in that. We're going to grow tetracelmus in tanks if we can because it does well in that and it doesn't stick to the walls and all that stuff. Um, we're going to grow these algae semi continuously. We're going to have 600 mil per kilogram live weight of oysters per day. And we're going to feed uh, either once a day in a 12 liter tank or twice a day in a six liter tank or something like that. So again, it's taking, you know, like great big simple numbers and, and walking your way through a calculation of what kind of algae you need, how you're going to grow it, how much you need to grow. To, to feed broodstock oysters for however many weeks it is you're, you're gonna do that. Um, how many people take that kind of approach versus set a goal and then have things starve and, and, and then have to back off on, on your goal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that, that, you know, that not everybody thinks about. And all I'm hoping is that, you, you know, you have those sheets in your, in your, in your handouts. <clears throat> like if, if you're thinking about planning next year's production, you know, walk through as much of this as you can. And, and again, it, a lot of the, um, the information you need is in scientific literature, maybe not that accessible to you, but you can talk to me or you can talk to, extension people and, and get a lot of um, the quantitative data you need. I'm going to do one, yeah? Yes, okay. yeah. And you know, that, I mean, that again was just kind of like pulled out of, yeah. out of the air. Um, it's better than, than not considering it. You could refine this quite a lot actually. You know, again, as your business gets larger, the imperative to, to, to plan this better becomes more important. But you know, at least thinking about it, like, you know, is this realistic? I want to make, you know, um, 1.5 billion seed next year. You know, what would my algal production need to look like to do to condition broodstock to do that? You could do this kind of calculation and say, this is possible, I could do that. Or you know what, it's not going to happen. And the next example is the, um, it's not going to happen. So, um, oh yeah, there's one more here on the container size, but yeah, and here it says I assumed a 50-50 mix. Um, and, and a little more details, 30 liters for 100 liter cow wall every other day. So you need two cow wall cultures. You know, you could bring this right down to what, what the footprint in your, in your facility would look like to accomplish this, this feeding. You know, and again, I really encourage it, especially again, as you're, as you're planning for a season, like think these things through mathematically and decide if it's something you can do or what your limitations are. You know, what's your limiting factor? And if you want to exceed that limitation, this is where you have to put effort. And it's very often with microalgae. It's not with how much tankage you have for, for larvae or for, you know, broodstock or something like that. So the second example um, is actually, you know, a, a sad story, but it's one I think Leslie will, uh, will enjoy. Um, we had a fantasy that we could make bay scallops a one season crop in Long Island Sound <clears throat> by putting a 25 millimeter seed scallop in, in the water on uh, Memorial Day. And we actually knew that was true because by you know, overwintering some, 
Overwintering mortality, by the way, is a, is a real hit on base scallops. But the ones that survive, they're 25 millimeters on the 25th of May. By October, they're 75 millimeters in market size. So if only we could make a 25 millimeter seed scallop, you know, from January to, um, to, to the end of May, we could have a one season crop and probably make money on, on uh, base scallops. So I said, okay, what can we do? So we did a bunch, I already showed you feeding studies with, with base scallops, so you know that we did that work. So we said, okay, biochemically, what do we need? You know, similar kind of um, things are important. Um, we need a source of um, DHA, which we have a number of choices. Uh, we need a, what is that one? Uh, anyway, we need um, total lipid or starch for energy. Uh, we need cholesterol or 24-methylene cholesterol, very sim similar kind of nutritional needs. That's why the same algae keeps getting used. But here we determined actually that, let me go back, we can get everything we need for, um, for base scallop, oops, base scallop growth. You know, we looked at, at, look at it in the other dimension here. Everything we need for base scallop growth, all of the columns are covered by the presenophytes, by tetraselmus strains. So we said, okay, you know, so we actually only have to grow tetraselmus for this application. That's good because our greenhouse was, was good at that, <clears throat> growing it in a tank for $30 a dry kilogram. So we're looking actually pretty, pretty, we're pretty happy with ourselves right now. We operate those semi-continuously. They last a year. So, you know, we're starting to feel good about this process. So here we go, 3% live weight in dry weight algae per day from our work, and we want the seed up to 25 millimeters. So, you know, 25 millimeter scallop is 2.25 grams, therefore you do the simple arithmetic, you need 7.5 milligrams dry weight for 25 millimeter scallop per day, and F cultures are making us 200 milligrams per liter of algae. So, um, According to this, we need three liters of algal culture for every 25 millimeter scallop per day at the end. Now, this is just at the end. So we can prorate that back to the smaller guys. Um, our pseudofeces threshold again of 10 milligrams per liter. So, you know, we need a, um, 60 liters uh, per scallop to, to not exceed that. Um, we know already that 16 feedings per day is optimal. So that helps us set the water volume that we put uh, a certain number of scallops in, um, and we get about a three-day division time in tetraselmus, so we can, um, in our system at the time, we could harvest 5,000 liters per day, <clears throat> thereby supporting 1,700 25 millimeter scallops um, in a system volume of, of 6,500 liters. Um, Sorry. And so th this was completely practically impractical. And the one last thing that I'll, I'll tell you is the cost of, um, of each of those, oops, 1,700 25 millimeter scallops by the time it got to that size was about $7.50 in, in algae alone. So this was a losing proposition. And you know, it, it caused our entire labs, <laughs> you know, we needed the background work to know this, but our, it caused our entire labs program to, to turn off on, on base scallops. And, you know, to tell our constituents, <clears throat> you know what, <laughs> we don't think this is the one season crop thing is going to work. So if you don't solve winter mortality, um, you can forget about the base scallop as, a, as an aquaculture candidate. You know, and, and again, you know, it's using a lot of available knowledge and, and just, you know, doing your simple arithmetic um, and, you know, and using the knowledge that we have from some basic practical research to, to do a scenario test. You know, so again, that's what this um, decision tree thing is about and what, the, um, what those three sheets are about. So, you know, I keep them with you. And again, as you're thinking about next year's planning, think about what you're, you know, what you're trying to do, what you're going to do. If there is knowledge, if there isn't knowledge, <clears throat> it's either, you know, ask a researcher, or next time, if you're missing a chunk of knowledge to, to do a similar kind of calculation, and uh, extension people can't give it to you and I can't give it to you, when you are polled about what your industry needs in terms of science,
tell them that's what you need. You know, we need the cost of, of growing uh, you know, ketosterous calcitrans in a, in a tube culture or something, you know. So, I mean, that, again, that's how to, you know, in a big way, in scenario testing, use, use the knowledge that, you know, our lab has spent decades and, you know, tens of millions of dollars at this point generating. It's not all completely solid, but there's enough information there to actually get at least a qualitative um, take on whether something is practical or, wh or whether you have the information you need to make, uh, make a business kind of decision. So that's, that's that, I, but I wanted to do one more thing. Be, again, I was anticipated by someone during a break about this, so I, I did include it uh, originally. So um, everything I've talked about so far has been these controlled laboratory experiments. We try to isolate variables, but the real world is not, um, not an isolated variable um, construct, right? Everything is changing all at once all the time. And so, you know, how, <clears throat> Science demands one thing, farming demands um, resilience to change. And it's something we became aware of and started to try to, to, to do some work on. So here's you know, some examples of some things that we found out. So you know, this transition from, uh, from hatcher to field is, um, introduces all this variability. Um, we know that defense against infection and parasite infestation is a cellular system in bivalves based on an immune system um, where the main player are these cells called hemocytes. And here's a photomicrograph. There are granular hemocytes that look like amoeba, and there are um, hyaline or agranular cells that are little round things. Um, in summary, what I can tell you about these cells, they, they circulate throughout the animal. Um, they are exactly equivalent to um, immune cells in, in human uh, immunology, but they're in the innate immune system. So there's, there are cells in, in all of our bodies called neutrophils that are the first responders to an injury or infection. And these are not uh, based on antibodies. They're just, they're cells that circulate all the time and they go to a site of injury or infection and they start to kill bacteria there. So um, oysters, clams, mussels, scallops, pretty much all invertebrates have hemocytes that are the same as our neutrophils. So there's a lot, we, we started to read biomedical literature to understand these cells. So um, we asked the question, because there's so much biomedical literature, is what, you know, eat this food, it's good for your Im immune system, right? I mean, how many times have you read that? So it's like, that must, I wouldn't say must be, that may be true for, for oysters and clams as well. So we started to do work with, um, with the blood cells and, and try to understand how uh, nutrition might affect the um, resilience of small bivalves when they make the transition from your controlled coddled environment of a hatchery to the, the wild jungle of, uh, of the bay here. <laughs> Um, so, you know, here's some stuff from a paper we did in 2004. It's, it's kind of old now. We keep, we keep adding new stuff, but this was kind of a watershed for us. Um, so we did experiments with the same tools that I've described already. Um, we fed on different diets for, and I'll show you what those diets are, for five weeks at 20C. We did a rapid temperature increase to stress them and continue feeding, and we measured before and after this heat stress in the two groups um, a number of dependent variables related to these hemocytes. Um, so how many there were, um, how, how many were dead versus alive, um, how they were phagocytic, so they, <clears throat> the amoeboid ones uh, engulf bacteria the way uh, an amoeba in, engulfs food and destroy it inside the cell. And then uh, they also aggregate around infections to isolate the infection. And then oxidative burst, which is <clears throat> response in the hemocytes that allows them to kill the bacteria in the vacuoles. So we could measure all these variables with a flow cytometer. Um, so here's the diets that we fed, and here's how they, they differ. 
we fed um, the high lipid tetracelmus uh, and skeletonema, which has a lot of DHA actually, and <clears throat> you know a 50-50 mix. And you can see that the chief ways these varied, the diets varied from each other were in DHA and in the kinds of sterols that were present. So um, mu much more of a difference in, in the DHA because uh, tetracelmus has zero. Okay, so it's almost a test of a DHA deficiency on immune function. We didn't actually think of it that way when we started, but the results <laughs> kind of led us to recognize that that's what we had done. So this is, you know, some fairly complicated graphs about um, the different immune functions, but I'll, I can summarize by saying um, we were able, using principal components, to <clears throat> show a, a, a good immune profile versus a bad immune profile using all of these um, functional hemocyte analyses. So good ones are here, bad ones are here. Um, the temperature increase decreased the immuno capability of the oysters. And um, with too little food um, or food with no, no DHA, the temperature effect was worse on whether there was good immune function or not. And so, you know, in the end, what we proved here is that the good immune function was associated with the better the immune function was in the skeletonema fed oysters compared to the tetracelmus. So we've been touting tetracelmus as this great diet and everything in the, in the, in the nursery, in the, you know, in the hatchery and nursery, which it certainly is when you consider only growth. But when you consider the resilience of the seed when you put it out into the, uh, into the environment, um, tetracelmus with its deficiency in DHA is not a sufficient diet. So we actually now tell people, you know, throw them some diatomes for a week before you put them out. You know, if you want to use tetracelmus for like the first, you know, a couple of weeks after setting and everything and, and you're, you know, your hatchery system is consistent, that's great. But for sure, throw them some something with DHA. You could use T-ISO at that point, but most hatcheries are, are <clears throat> using all the T-ISO they got to feed larvae. But yep. Right, but tetracelmus has it. So the only thing um, T-ISO is, is truly deficient in is sterols. Uh, and, and there's a question whether uh, the oysters need both DHA and EPA. Uh, they grow great on EPA alone, but again, to be really healthy, they need some DHA in their diet too. And then, you know, again, it was, it was kind of a revelation for us because we, you know, we were very proudly talking about how great tetracelmus is. But I mean, this is a provision that, you know, again, and this is for oysters. I don't know, clams may be similar in some way, but it's something to be aware of that, you know, think about um, immunocompetence and the importance of DHA in it as you're designing your system for putting, uh, bringing seed through your hatchery. Is the finding there. And then a couple of more things about larvae that we found, and some of it's a little bit weird. Um, so this is the, actually the, um, I keep talking about the, the sterile composition um, of, of T-ISO, and as you can see, it's got, you know, all um, brassica sterile, or epibrassica sterile, actually, um, and none of the, these are the, you know, the good, uh, sterols here in the tetracelmuses that are are zero here. So um, <clears throat> and I already kind of talked through some of this. The um, this is the pathway by which um, 24 methylene substituted sterols are um, modified to cholesterol. This is in the side chain of a very big molecule that's, that's all down here. But um, this actually was previously described in insects. And you can imagine uh, these are insects that eat agricultural plants. So you can imagine why all that money was spent on articulating a sterile pathway because of all the damage insects do to, to plant crops. So again, it's taking advantage we had that insight when we went looking for the pathway, so it was targeted and it was pretty easy to get to. But you know, nobody had had done that before. 
Uh, and then the other weird thing I mentioned about Pavlov, I had a master's student who were still writing paper on this because he's a terrible writer, and I won't mention his name for that reason, but um, we, we made some weird observations with um, adding mono to, um, to larval cultures of um, base gallops. And, um, you know, it looked at first like they were, they were kind of failing after, um, you know, after less than 10 days. Um, so here's, uh, where's Pavlova? Uh, anyway, I'll get there. The results led us to think that <clears throat> there might be um, more going on than nutrition with Pavlova. And we used a, an insecticide called called AZA <laughs> that is used to, um, to disrupt cuticle formation in insects to see if we could um, disrupt larval setting and we were able to do that. So that told us there was a, a pathway in setting that involved um, this hormone called ecdysone. And I don't know if anybody's heard of Ecdysone, anybody have any insect? Is that, um, there's a, a product called neem oil that you can spray on your fruit trees to prevent caterpillars from eating it that has this AZA um, that blocks ecdysone, and ecdysone is necessary in insects for pupation. <clears throat> and, you know, we got this, you know, again, because methyl pavlovol, which is a compound only in pavlova, had such a similar uh, structure, we thought, first of all, that we know that ecdysone is active in, in uh, base gallop larvae because we could stop setting by poisoning ecdysone. And we had evidence that by adding pavlova, which contains this weird sterol, we were uh, inducing metamorphosis early. And you know, the structure of the compounds, depending if you draw this one, like the tipped up a little bit, it really is quite the same. Um, so, so basically, yes, I, I eliminated a bunch of slides to try to make things go quicker, but um, the basic story with pavlova is at least in base gallops and oysters, we know it has a hormonal effect in addition to a nutritional one. And that hormonal effect induces metamorphosis and it'll induce metamorphosis um, very small and very young uh, larvae, which sometimes is a bad thing because not many of them that metamorphose that early survive. So we've kind of stopped recommending pavlova as a, a, a mixed diet from the beginning of larval life because, you know, using mono early on tends to cause early metamorphosis and poor setting percentages. On the other hand, if you have a carboy of mono around and you have a batch of larvae that are starved uh, or that are stalled and they're, you know, they're pet of villagers, but they're not setting, you know, you can give them uh, tetracelmus and it'll give them the sterol if that's the deficiency. But if you give them mono, you're giving them both the sterol they need and you're also giving them an ecdysone analog that's going to start, jumpstart the process of metamorphosis. And this is something that actually quite a number of farms up in the Northeast are, are using. They keep a, keep a monoculture, you know, a carboy going all the time. <clears throat> and right when they want to set a batch and they look like they're starting to set, to get them to all go like overnight, put a, bu a bunch of uh, pavlova in the tank. And it seems to be, you know, practically it would be working pretty well. And as I said, I wish this student would send me a decent draft of his, <laughs> his work so we could get it in the, in the literature. We should have that pretty soon, I hope. So, um, you know, just a really giant overview of, of you know, this stuff is, um, please remember what, how much, and how often when you're designing things. Um, you know, think about how you're culturing things when you're harvesting them to where you have the best biochemical nutritional composition for your application. And um, I think you'll get more 
you know, economic return from the effort you put into algal culture. I know it's tough and uh, you, you can outsource that, right? You know, or you can do it yourself. And if you look at, you know, agriculture, a lot of uh, like dairy farmers, <clears throat> you know, not every, not every dairy farmer does silage uh, or does a feedlot kind of approach. They have, they manage fields of hay as part of, you know, being a farmer. So it's your, kind of your choice as hatchery operators, you know, to do this yourself, do it on site, have control over it, <clears throat> you know, optimize it for your application. You can outsource it, you can buy algae. Now, you can do a combination of those two things. And, you know, again, the bottom line is it's your decision. But the more knowledge you have and the more capability, if the reason you decide to outsource is because you don't have the, the knowledge or skill to grow algae, I hope I gave you some knowledge today, tomorrow morning, you know, give you some skill how to keep algae alive, um, to use them, you know, for propagating your, your own large scale cultures for feeding. So, you know, again, I, <clears throat> I think I, I've avoided always in these workshops and talks like this and so on to tell you how you should do something. What I'm trying to do is give you knowledge, give you ideas. And, you know, there's nobody more creative than a farmer. In, in turning knowledge into uh, into you know smart strategy, so I encourage you to use as much knowledge as as you have, and and you know and to seek more knowledge. I mean you know get it yourself. Ask me. Um, ask your extension agent. Ask your local university people with expertise. When you need a piece, of, you think you need a piece of knowledge, it's probably there somewhere, and somebody can help you with it. So so get that knowledge, and and you know I think you all have the the tools to um, do this better and make money. That's the idea. You know, so. And I'm in the Department of Commerce. So anyway, thanks for your attention so far. And you know, we'll do a bit more tomorrow. Right. So let's start with some questions. And actually, I'll start. So let's go back to clams and your decision support tree, because we now know that 10% may not be a high enough feed rate. So if our hatcheries are feeding the same amount of algae to their oysters as they do their clam larvae, why not? I mean, then they're underfeeding the clams. Isn't that the bottom line? Are doing doing on the same amount of food, and you know, we're, it's worth a try to feed them some more, the clams some more. And, and see if, you know, if your performance goes up. I mean, it's kind of the, you know, the, the best we can do as far as that's concerned. But, you know, for sure, post set, you know, <clears throat> after they've set, if you, you know, you have a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever, that you're still feeding them cultured algae, for sure, for clams, you want to minimize that. You mean you want to get them out? You want to get them out, yeah. <laughs> so the, the question is, you didn't see it in any of those. Yes. In, in Manichloropsis, and it's got a good sterile profile. So, you know, were it digestible, it's small, it's, right, you know, it's, it, would, it would be beautiful. And um, so I had a, um, a, actually an undergraduate student project. I mentioned we tried a bunch of, um, of enzymes to, to add to the algal culture to um, attack the cell wall in some way that would make it digestible. And we had slightly positive results with an enzyme called phytase that's very commonly used in a bunch of agricultural applications. So, you know, somebody somewhere someday might, um, 
you know, might follow up on, on, on that, but, you know, it wouldn't be feeding right out of the algal tank. You'd have to, you know, add something to it. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, so, you know, the, um, for, for the benefit of those on, 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 on online, the, you know, the <clears throat> comment was that there's um, experience showing that clams clear nanochloropsis and, you know, and produce fecal pellets that are the right color, you know, and <clears throat> our observations is, is that those cells are intact and in fact reculturable after they pass the digestive system, which means they've not been in, digested right very, very effectively. And, you know, and that gives me actually an opportunity to talk about how, what, what, what is selection? Does anybody know how, so, how food selection works in a bivalve? Huh? Size is one criteria. Yeah. Eh, density. So, but but. So, so how does a, how does a gill filter work? Does it work like a screen? Does it catch cells? Anybody know that? So this is like this is super fascinating, and I had a um, a student at UConn did a master's and a PhD with Evan Ward, who was like the expert on feeding physiology and bivalves. And I was really thrilled to be on the, these two committees and work with Maria Rosa, who did a couple of brilliant papers. If you want to read about selection, Maria Rosa and Evan Ward, and my name's on them too. <clears throat> so the way that particle capture happens is on the gills, on the long axis of the gill filaments, are cilia that beat like this. And algal cells become entrained, and all particles, sand, silt, bacteria, become entrained in the flow of water along these gills. <clears throat> and they're brought down to the outer margin of the shell, where there are cells that produce mucus on the mantle. And so all these particles are trapped in this mucus, and other cilia on the mantle edge move this line of slurry of mucus and trapped particles to an organ called the labial palps, which is at the mouth. And these palps are finger-like things. And the cells on the labial palps sense something about each particle, not each one, but the main component of what's coming to them at that time, and, and make a decision whether to pull the stuff in and stuff it into the mouth or to flick it out and reject it as pseudofeces. So the labial palps, the question Maria addressed in her master's and PhD, what is it about a particle? What are the characteristics of a particle that make the labial palps say, yes, I want to eat this? Talk about a challenging question, but she got there. And here's what it is. There's two physical characteristics. It's <clears throat> wettability, so how hydrophobic or hydrophilic the surface is and charge, whether there's positive or negative charge on the particle. And the third component you have to know is the sugar composition of the outside of the particle. Now, algal cells and bacteria cells have either a wall or a membrane, uh, and sometimes a mucus layer that is composed to a large extent of some kind of sugar. Some of the algal cell walls are cellulose, which is a, a glucose polymer, right? And some of them. Uh, the membranes have have um, have a mucus layer outside that have uh, mannose and fructose and different sugars associated with them. There are lectins expressed on the cells of the labial palps that either stick to those sugars or don't stick to those sugars. And the lectin composition of the labial palps of a bivalve, and the sur if we're within the surface charge and the wettability of the particle so that it's, it interacts with these receptors for sugar determines whether or not 
that bunch of particles is eaten or rejected. So it's a fascinating process. But I mean, you know, like knowing that when you see a lot of pseudofeces production, unless you say, well, there's something about the particles there that, you know, that they don't recognize as food. That's how they recognize a lot of silt in the water. And there's no point in filling the gut with silt. Reject that stuff and keep only what sticks to the labial palps, and, and that's what you eat. So a nanochloropsis cell, got the right surface charge wettability. It's got, you know, sugar, uh, the wall is, is cellulose, and, and you know, that says so glucose, and there are receptors in the labial palps. So there's everything about that particle says this is food, they eat it. But now they don't have the enzyme capacity in their digestive system to, to break through that wall that they just recognized, you know, used to recognize this as, as food. So is it protective mechanism on the part of the algae? It may be. We have a better example, actually, of um, Alexandrium, which, while it's being swatted around like a ping pong ball by the cilia <clears throat> on the way to the, the ventral food groove to, to be eaten, Alexandrium catenella casts off its cell wall and covers itself in a sporopollenin wall as, as an oval cell called a temporary cyst. The temporary cyst is indigestible, whereas the vegetative cell is easily digested. So the race is how fast can Alexandrium produce a temporary cyst versus how fast does the bivalve capture it and bring it to the mouth and eat it? So, you know, it's like, that is absolutely protection. That's an evolved, response of a microalga to being eaten by a bivalve. It's kind of incredible when you think about it, you know, I mean, how evolved dinoflagellates especially are. I don't think they use stigmatophytes or, or that evolved because they don't have that kind of behavior, but did they evolve an indigestible wall as a, as a survival uh, trait? Yeah, I'd say probably, probably did. And, you know, do, does it matter to them if, if they spend half, you know, a day or what is it? Gut transit time is, right, you know, does it matter to them if they spend that amount of time in the dark uh, before they're pooped out to grow again? Yeah, probably not, you know, it's in the scheme of things, you know. Like Jonah and the whale, right? You know, yeah, yep. So I had a question from online from Tara Riley. She says, hi Gary. Hi Tara. Um, I honestly recommend none in the early larval stage. And again, you know, our approach, Tara, is uh, T-ISO alone, while um, most of the lipids are coming from the yolk, um, by the time they're 150, we put um, Tetracelvus uh, striata plat P in. When we have pedovilagers, we very often put about 10% of the diet as pavlova. And that is just a matter of convenience. It makes them all set overnight. <clears throat> 